Hello, I'm Dan Berry and I'm going to talk to you about isolating line work from a background. Now I work with pen and ink generally on watercolour paper and so if I'm ever trying to separate the line work from the background what I generally have to do is to try and push back some of that watercolour paper texture that I've scanned in uh, so I can then add in colour in between the line work and this transparent background so that it can end up looking cool at the end. That's the aim, it's all got to look cool at the end. Uh, so if I jump into Photoshop now, what I've done is I've made a quick sample with a few different kinds of drawing in there. This hasn't been cleaned up, this is just the, the raw scan. So there's a fine liner drawing, there's a mechanical pencil drawing. These were done very quickly by the way. Uh, a normal pencil drawing, not a mechanical pencil drawing, a fountain pen drawing, uh, a hog hair brush drawing, and then I've done some quick sort of swashy little samples of dry brush work. So what we have is we've got a wide selection of different kinds of brush work and ink work that we can play with. Um, if I zoom in a bit, we'll be able to see, hopefully you'll be able to see this, there should be, you can see the watercolor paper shadow. I, I really like textured uh, watercolor paper. I like it when there's paint on top of it. I like it when you get some of that texture in your line work. That's really cool. It suits the way I draw it, you know, that's my catnip. That's cool. I like it. However, I don't like it when that watercolor shadow prints on paper. I think it ends up looking a little bit mucky. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is explain how I'm going to work. I'm going to try and do everything through the menus so you can see where I'm going. I'm going to try and avoid using keyboard shortcuts, and if I do, I'm going to try and explain why I'm doing them and what I'm pressing so you can play along. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to look at getting rid of that background, that shadow, but I'm going to keep some of that texture in there. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use uh, Image Adjustments Levels. Levels is pretty neat. Um, the way I think about it is it shows you a little graph of where all the light and dark pixels are on your image. So on this image that we have that I've got open here, you can see it corresponds to this little gray to black to white uh, bar along the bottom there. You've got perfect black down there and perfect white there. There's quite a lot. There's a huge hump there on this graph of white. Uh, you would expect that given that it's you know lines on a white background and then there's a hump around the sort of 80% grayish and that's going to be the line work and the pencils and uh, the brushwork that I've put in there. The cool thing about this is I can then reset where perfect black is and you can go really overboard with this so if I drag that black slider up you can see that it's gobbling up everything that used to be gray and now it's replacing anything beyond that point with with black. Here it goes, and you can be really heavy handed with this and make your work look repugnant really quickly. But there we go, we can see that uh, watercolor texture shadow in the background. Um, that might be quite subtle, but it will print and it will give me the heebie jeebies, and I don't really want that. Uh, all I want to do is kind of accentuate the, the darkness of the line just enough, so I'm going to bring it just to that sort of tipping point there. I don't want to blow out any of that texture because uh, I think it's going to end up looking a bit gross. And I'm going to bring down some of those subtle greys to about there. And that seems to have, by and large, if I'm looking at my screen, just made those uh, that watercolour paper shadow just a little less clear. So that would be my first step. Now I've kept all of that texture, uh, I've kept all of the, the drawing is intact, it's still there. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move to channels, which is a little tab that's usually hidden behind layers, and if you've never used it before, I don't blame you, uh, it's one of those things that's sort of hidden in Photoshop. We don't tend to use it very often, uh, but it's got one feature I like to use a lot. Uh, if you come down to the bottom there, there's a little button that looks like um, the European Union flag. If you hover over it, it should say load channel as a selection. If you tap that, what it's going to do is it's going to load everything that's white as a selection. So you now you can see we've got all the marching ants marching across your page. So anything that is white is 100% selected, and anything that is black is 100% not selected. The cool thing about this is that anything that's like 50% grey is 50% selected which is cool, so we get that sort of graduated selection in there somewhere, which is really neat, but it's kind of the wrong way around at the moment, so if we were to sort of copy and paste and do anything like that, it would kind of mess us up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to make a new layer, um, so I've made a new layer, I'm going to go edit and fill, 
If you know the shortcuts for these things, by all means do them. Choose whichever color you want. I'm going to use black because it's going to be easier to see. We did something wrong. Let's go backwards in time. The thing we did wrong is we didn't invert the selection. If we invert the selection and go back and do the same again, we should be able to see what we have there is our line work. Pretty cool. So you can see that what it loads as white as a selection, we have to invert it and flip it. I hope you get that. If we add a layer underneath there, if you hold down the command button on a Mac, I think it's the control button on a PC, I think, who knows, you'll make a, and tap the new layer button in your layers tab, you should make a new layer underneath it, edit and fill that with white to imitate that paper, you should see that we kind of end up where we were to begin with, which is pretty neat. Um, if I wanted to color in this line work now, um, the way I used to do this was with masks, which confused the heck out of me, and it still does every single time. Uh, clipping masks, I can't think of a nice way to remember it, I just never can. So what I do now, with this line work separated onto a brand new layer, and we have all of these transparent pixels where there's nothing there, there's no white, there's nothing, it's the void, it's empty. Uh, next to the word lock in your layer tab, you've got the first little icon there and it looks like a little chessboard, a little checkerboard and if you hover over it it says lock transparent pixels. If we tap that and then grab a brush, if we try and paint any anything on those transparent pixels nothing's gonna happen. Um, if we get this guy and we paint where there are pixels we can paint on those transparent pixels. So those transparent pixels are locked, they're not going anywhere but the pixels that are there, they're there. That's pretty cool. So we can then do that. But notice that it's keeping that opacity of the line work as well. So if we want to build things up in layers, um, we can. That's pretty neat. If you don't like that opacity, you can duplicate your layers as well and build them up and give them more heft and beef. You can always work with the opacity of individual layers to sort of blend those together as and how you want. Now, that is kind of a long and convoluted way to do it, which is kind of a pain in the pipe. So there must be an easier way to do it. This is, uh, you must have seen the history tab. You might have had your life saved by this history tab in the past. So you can go backwards in time and see what you've done. So we can see that we've used the brush tool, the lock layer, the fill tool, new layers, deselect, select inverse, and all that nonsense. Uh, I can go all the way back to the start of time in this document and see when we opened it. Cool. We have a companion uh, tool to the history thing, which is called Actions. And if you haven't used Actions before, they're wonderful. Like history goes backwards in time, Actions can go forwards in time. So you can record the things that you do and then play them back again and again and again. So for all the really, really boring stuff you do, like going to the channels thing, loading channels of selection, inverting the thing, filling it with a color, blah, blah, blah. You know, the boring stuff that a computer can just do, you can just tell the computer to do it and it will do it and it's wonderful and it will save you time. You can go and make a cup of coffee. You can go and do anything you like while the computer does that work for you. It's great. So uh, what I would do is make a new folder within your actions tab. If you've played with actions before and you've seen things like vignette in there and thought this is useless, yeah the default ones are rubbish um, and they don't really give you a good idea of anything that they can do. Basically anything that you can put into a menu you can make it do it again. Uh, if you got the brush and you recorded an action of you drawing something with a brush, it wouldn't remember that you did that. So it's a clever tool, but it's not smart, if you understand. If you make a new folder, uh, I'm going to call this one Cool Actions, um, what you can do with that folder is you can export it. You can save it, you can send it to a friend, you can put it onto a hard drive and back it up. So if your computer inevitably bursts into flames, because they all do around deadline time, you can save those and you can always come back to them, uh, which is very useful. So now I have a, a folder called Cool Actions. I have like a bunch of folders for everything. Uh, within Actions, you can also play Actions, so you can have Actions inside Actions, which is dead cool. So let's make a new action and let's call it Line Work. And we'll do this all over again. Cool Actions, Line Work. You can also set it to a function key. Uh, I could set this to Shift uh, Command F1 and this will then, every time I press Shift Command F1, it will play this action, which will be neat. I think I've got that set to something else, so I'm not gonna do that now. Record. So the things that we did is we set the levels. So I could go back and try and do those things again. 
Now I know if I'm working on, on a comics project, for example, I might have 50 pages that are all done with the same ink and pen on the same paper and they're scanned in on the same scanner and the same computer and the same settings and everything. So I know that there's going to be a level of consistency across all of these things. So I want to just say the same thing over and over and over again. But I've already done this once today and I don't want to have to do it again. Uh, Photoshop has this sort of secret hidden little trick inside it where you can just say, do that last thing I did, I don't want to think about it. So if you hold down the Alt key or the Option key uh, on my computer, it's a Mac, it's called Option, it says Option, it's next to the Mac Command key. If you hold down the Option key and press anything, it will give you the last used settings from that. And that works with the shortcut as well. So if I press Escape and press Command, Option, L, for levels, then it will bring up the last used thing, which is super useful. So I don't have to think about this, I don't have to reset it, it'll just do the same thing that I wanted it to do last time. Cool. So that's done, and you can see that that has recorded that into the action. So that's nice. Uh, I'm going to go to channels, I'm going to load the channel as a selection. Neat. I'm going to go back to layers, I'm going to go to select the inverse. That's swap that all around. That's pretty neat. I'm very I'm delighted with that. That's wonderful. I'm going to go to Layer, New, Layer. This will give me the option to name this layer. I'm terrible when I'm working for just using shortcuts and then not naming things, but because I only need to set this up one time, I'm going to actually do this properly. I'm going to say, call this one Lines. Look at that, it's called Lines now. So every time I run this action, it's going to call this li uh, layer Lines. Pretty, pretty neat. Edit and fill. Let's fill that with black. OK. And then I'm going to select, deselect. Now remember, anything that we do now is being recorded. So if I get something wrong, it's going to record that as well. Oops. Um, so I'm going to hold down for me. It's the Command button. And I'm going to press the new layer. And that's giving me a layer underneath. If you get this wrong, it's okay. We can edit things inside the action afterwards. We can take things and delete them and move things around. So if you get things wrong, don't worry. Uh, I had to go through so many different versions of every action before I got them right and sort of tweak them the way that I want to. So if you get it wrong, don't worry. You can duplicate actions and come back and save your game and start again. So don't worry. Do some fun actions. Mess around with it a bit. You know, Take the fear out of it. It'll be absolutely fine. Um, so holding down Command and pressing that new layer tab, we'll put a layer underneath it. If we start grabbing layers and moving them around inside the layer stack, Photoshop looks for the layer with that name. And so if you come and use your action on a new document, it's going to look for that named thing. So if you're on a document that hasn't been worked in exactly this same way, then it's going to look for that named layer. And if it's not there, it's going to go, well, I don't know what that is. And it's going to fold its arms and it's not going to work and you're going to get frustrated with it. So doing things this way should mean that it's not going to look for a specific named layer. Using that shortcut will mean make a new layer underneath this one, if you understand. Uh, I'm going to fill that just with white. OK. So what we should have now is we have an action that sets the levels with the things that I asked it to do earlier. It should set a selection from the um, channel there. Um, it's saying here from the RGB channel, what happens if you put a CMYK image into it? Oh my god, no, it does exactly the same thing, don't worry too much about it. It'll inverse the selection, it'll make a new layer called lines, it will fill it with black, it will set the selection to nothing, uh, it will make a new layer below, and it will fill it with white, and that will do it every single time. So again, let's go backwards in time in the history tab to the beginning of this document. Go to actions, I'm going to just, it's very windy here today, select my line work action. I'm going to hit play, zip, and it just did it. And it's done. And it's it's all there. So the, the line work is now completely done. The layers are all there. I can lock the transparent pixels on that one, and I can give this guy a hairstyle again. And it's really, really useful. The coolest thing about actions is obviously you can save them and you can replay them back again and again. You can move them to a different computer. Uh, you can tweak them. You can edit them. You can duplicate them. But you can also uh, you can batch process them. So this is really, really sort of next level useful. So if you go to File, Automate, and Batch, it brings up this dialog. So I can use my 
cool action line work, I can point that at a whole folder. So say I've scanned in a 24-hour comic or hourly comics or something, and I want it to play these exact actions on this entire folder full of scans. You know, maybe it's uh, duplicate them, scale them all to the same size to go on your website, for example. Save them all as a new thing, put them into a new folder. You can do that while you go and make a cup of coffee. Walk the dog, like feed the cat, anything you like, while the computer does the heavy lifting for you. It's really, really good. It's like having a robot butler. And who doesn't want a robot butler? Actions, your robot butler. So I hope that's useful. Uh, I find it incredibly useful. Uh, play with actions, see what you can do with them. Uh, my name is Dan Barry. I hope this has been useful.